Not if I could have your mic for just a second. Sure. All right, we set. Hello, everybody. Scott Furkin here, coming to you from Kenwood Hill in the south end of Louisville, Kentucky, where it's time for another in a series of interviews with guest artists appearing at the Hill House on Devil's Backbone. Tonight, I'll be speaking with singer, songwriter, guitarist Seth Walker, uh, one of the most prolific contemporary Americana artists on the scene. Uh, during his 30-year career, he's released a slew of albums and performed at venues all across the world. And tonight, in connection with Kentucky Performing Arts, he brings his eclectic mix of uh, blues, R&B, gospel, pop, rock, you name it, uh, to the Hill House. Well, Seth, welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you. I was glad to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I, I s introduced you as an Americana artist. Yeah. Um, what does that term mean to you, and do well, you embrace it? Gosh, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it seems like that term is widening and widening and widening, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, usually when I, t when I try to describe it, which is sometimes tough, um, yeah. I guess I maybe point them in that direction because it does encompass roots, mostly roots music, I guess. Right. And so um, I can, uh, blues music is the, probably the root of my music, you know, with the exception of my upbringing being in classical music. I grew up playing classical music, uh, cello. But blues music definitely qualifies as American, Americana. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned your upbringing. Let's, yeah. let's start with that. Mm -hmm. uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in Burlington, North Carolina, which is, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's right in the middle of the state, Tobacco, Tobacco Road. And I grew up uh, just outside of um, Elon College, which is right there, a little town called Altamaha, Ossipee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Say yeah. that? Yeah, three yeah times really. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to just say AO. Yeah. Okay. Altima Hall, Ossipi. And my folks, um, both classical music teachers, mom plays violin, dad plays cello. They were Suzuki teachers. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but an ear training situation. Okay. So in, in that method, they start real young. So I, my, I started when I was five on the violin, then I moved to cello pretty quick. My sister started on violin when she was three. And that was our life. I mean, that, I, I didn't know anything different. Um, and I played the cello from age five until around 16. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted that, to ask you about your uncle, Landon Walker. Mm. Tell, him about, tell us about him and the impact he had on your development as a performing artist. Yeah, he, he is my, f my dad's brother. And I mean, my whole family, they're all musician, beautifully insane, crazy, beautiful people. But my dad's brother, Landon, he lived down in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And he was a jazz, incredible jazz bass player. Okay. He played with all the cats. He played with Lionel Hampton and all these dudes. And he had a radio show called the After Hours Cafe. And he got wind after I went to college that I was getting into blues music. He's like, oh, we got a live one here. So he started sending me his tapes his, uh, back in the ca cassette tapes days. Right. I remember him well. Yeah. <laughs> of his show. And it covered everything from, you know, Texas blues, T-Bone and Gate Mouth and Man's Lips Come to Lightning to the Chicago stuff to the Piedmont blues. Um, and that really started, things started happening for me. And then I, later on, I ended up moving to Jacksonville Beach, Florida, because he was the only pro that I knew, you know, outside mm -hmm. of my family. Mm -hmm. So very instrumental, yeah. Well, describe for us, if you will, your migration from classical music and the cello to the blues guitar. How did that come about? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, growing up with classical music, it wasn't that my parents really, um, they didn't teach with an iron fist or anything, but it was just, it wasn't something that, 
for whatever reason, I found or I discovered. You know, and I liked it, and I was pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. You know, I could bang around on it a little bit. Mm-hmm. But when I went to college... And where did you attend college? Or else should I say I enrolled <laughs> in co- East, East Carolina. Okay. These, these guys in my dorm room, they were playing Clapton and Stevie Ray Vaughan and Hendrix. And I was like, what the hell? I was like... <laughs> and I just, let me see that guitar. And, and my fingers have always been on strings, so, you know, it wasn't... So foreign for me. Yeah. But I just like the idea of just the expression of the blues, you know, like it wasn't it wasn't trained. You know, it's just all from here, which is quite a a difference. They're both classical music is obviously very soulful, beautiful music. I'm not belittling it at any means because it's the grandfather in a lot of ways, but um, it really it really moved me. And next thing I knew, man, I was off on a wild goose chase. Well, you've mentioned a few of your um, early musical influences. Uh, uh, what about John Mayall? I know we recently lost John, oh, yeah, and uh-huh. he was an influence on you. Comment a little bit about how he impacted your style. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, I remember those early records he did with Clapton. I remember not going to class and playing along with his records. And, um, I mean, and I listened to some of his albums later than that too. And then I, I, I've opened up a few shows with him for him through the years. And he was always such a gracious dude and an, uh, and an ambassador to the blues. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, when did you decide that you were going to be a professional musician? (laughs) I, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't think ever made, I don't think that was ever a decision, right? It wasn't like, hmm, should I or shouldn't I? It was like some weird thing. Like, I just, I was just tunnel visioned with it, man. I just, it's probably a good thing I didn't think about it too much, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, I know that you have performed at uh, venues all over the world, festivals, concerts, halls, whatever. Are there any particular uh, venues or shows or uh, experiences that stand out in your memory? Tell us about those. Oh, my God. (laughs) So many. That's a tough one, Scott. (laughs) Um, Well, I, I lived for a long time in Austin, Texas. After Jacksonville, I moved there, chasing the ghost. And so whenever I go back to Austin, there's, those are some of my favorite shows. There's something about that down there. Um, and then I will say this, this, this is one gig that stands out in memory. I was playing in Baez, Spain, which is up a little mountain town, North Spain. As I'm, I mean, these, these crowds are just like, ooh. Just corazón, I mean, just so much fire, so much heart. And I got done playing, and they all, all the fans started singing back to us. Your, so, your yeah, music? No, no, no. One oh. of their one of their songs. Oh, their, uh, okay. I mean, it brought it brought the band and I pretty much to tears. It was just it was just like that was a moment. I've had more than a more than a few of, of memorable ones, but those two stand out. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mentioned that you had produced a bunch of albums. How many albums have you put out? I've put out 12 studio albums and, and a live album, so 13 total. Okay. And I got, I got another one coming out March of next year. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the most recent one, I Hope I Know. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, how that came about, who else played, who produced. Um, well, it was a strange record because it was um, covid times Mm. so I was living in Nashville at the time and uh, there's a guy named John O'Ricks who is the drummer for the Wood Brothers Um, and he he had done two records prior and so we would just we would go to the studio in Nashville. Some of it I did from my house, but hell, about half of it I did from my house. Just it's like a, you know more of a solo acoustic kind of thing with, sure. with some stuff 
But we would get in that studio, he'd be on one end of the studio and me on the other. And we, it, what I, what, what I think came, the silver lining for all of that, especially through the lens of the framed in my album, is it kind of forced us, all of us, to just slow down. And that, it kind of, it reminded me of how frantic sometimes I have been in the recording process. Mm. Mm. You, know, you get in that studio and you're like, duh, 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 and you get all fired up and you look and the watch is, the clock's going and the red light's on. And sometimes, it, you know, it cannot, sometimes it's not the most zen of arenas. Okay. And Hope I Know album really, and the whole time in our lives uh, helped me slow down a little bit. Yeah. Well, well, something else happened during that COVID period that led to the uh, production of a book called mm. Your Van is on Fire. <laughs> yeah. uh, comment a little bit about that. How, how did that come about and, and what's well, in it? Well, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a, you know, me s staring out the window during COVID with no gigs, trying to <laughs> reinvent myself in a way. Um, outside of the album making. And um, I guess through the years, I, I had always liked to, I would do like little, what they call like a, little journals and stuff, and I would do like a, a word from the road email thing. And I've always had, I've always had some fun with it because it was, um, albeit short essays, mm -hmm. It seemed like an eternity outside of a three-minute song. You know, I could write a whole page, you know? Yeah. It really, and I just, oh, man, I just, I, I don't know. It's another one of those tunnel vision things. I didn't realize I was, I wasn't even planning to, to, to make a book, write a book. I was just, just writing. And the next thing I knew, I just kind of spun myself into this really cathartic, Thing. Well, it's full of essays, poems, and some of your original artwork as yeah, well. Yeah. But it sounds like that the title might have been inspired by a, a specific <laughs> event. Can you comment a little yeah, bit about it that? Did, it did. <laughs> you got to read the book. Okay. But, <laughs> but it was uh, the story of one of my very first gigs in college. And this. My, I broke a string on my guitar, and this dude in this Volkswagen van offered to take me to the guitar shop, okay. which later led to it being engulfed in flames and going backwards down the highway and things of subtle things of that nature. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I will read that book. <laughs> it seemed pretty like, you know, I was coming up with a name, a title for the book. It just seemed pretty, metaphorically speaking, apropos uh, for someone for life on the road playing music. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit about your songwriting process because mm -hmm. even though you put your own twist on some amazing covers, and I think we'll hear a couple of those tonight, mm -hmm. you're really um, mostly performing your own music. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the creative process, about how do, you, how do you come up with the idea for a song and how do you bring it to fruition? Well, there's, no, there's definitely no one way to do that. And there's no book to show you such things. Um, I, I think uh, the trick for me is firstly is to study the masters and learn how to build a house, you know? Mm -hmm. And then uh, just write a whole lot of bad songs. <laughs> Start with that. I mean, that's what Willie Nelson said. He's like, you know, Write you a hundred and then start over. Okay. Um, so, you you know, and I when I first started writing music songs, a lot of it came melodically first. Before I started getting into lyrics and things of that nature. And then, 
and then as, and then as I started writing more and more songs, started you know get a little bit more comfortable with with the with the language and how 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 they kind of work together. Mm -hmm. And then and now it's like hell. You might say something during this interview that may spark something for I, me. I don't know. It's just I like would, that's just the, that's that's the uh, it's it's an elusive muse. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah. I know you very recently returned from a gathering in Hillsburg, California called Songwriters in Paradise. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, it was a pretty sweet gig. Um, mm -hmm. There's probably 10 songwriters. A lot of them are from Nashville, a couple from Atlanta. And they've been doing this for 10 years, and they go to f four different locations, Hillsburg, Sonoma, Cabo and Bahamas or something. Mm. Sounds good to me. Yes. And um, and we just have th four nights of basically what they do is they put three songwriters on stage and then you just pat, you, I sing one, next person, next one, and then we back each other up and we hear their stories of how they wrote them, you cool. know, how they didn't, how they didn't. Um, and so it was good, and I didn't know, I, I had heard of some of these people, Dan Taminsky, Sean Mullins, I had heard mm. of them, but I never met them, so mm. it was, and I got surprised, pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by so many of the amazing songwriters. It influenced me for sure. Sounds wonderful. It was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you had a lot of success with your recordings. I know um, you've had music that's hit the top 20 on the Americana radio charts and number two on the Billboard um, blues album charts. Mm -hmm. So that must be satisfying uh, to have people respond to what you're putting out there and, uh, and nice. consume it. It's always nice when yeah. people connect. Yeah. Well, have you been to Louisville before? You know, I was thinking about that driving up, and I, I think so. Okay. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't remember where I played. I think I played one time with. Gary Clark Jr. somewhere mm -hmm. at some strange gig. It was like, I can't remember the name of this. It was a long time ago. Um, but not, not near enough. And it's a, it's, I'm actually staying right downtown in a little hotel. It's just, it just seems so revived and um, seems like a pretty cool city. It is indeed. Yeah. And, and in fact, you are headlining a show tomorrow evening at the Kentucky Center in the uh, Mex Theater. Yeah. Um, tell us tell us about that. My first time. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing nothing but great things about this place. I guess it's like a performing arts center situation. Right. And uh, I'm sure it'll be, a, you know, a listening type environment. Right. And I, I enjoy that like this, you know. Sure. Will you be doing some of the, the music that you're planning for tomorrow night in tonight's show? I'll probably mix it up a little bit, but I'll, yeah. I'll, the, some of it will weave, and, and, and hell, yeah. I, most time I don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the way we like it here. Well, it's been great to chat with you. Thanks for sitting down with me, and we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to Thank offer us so tonight. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. All right. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Scott.